Thank you, Father. Well, let's pray. Come on up this way, David, as I pray. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name, the name above all names. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, that <clears throat> thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we don't talk about you like you're not in the room. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that we don't forget <clears throat> it's all about you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's about as far as I can go with that, David. <clears throat> you want to come up here or you want to go down there? Okay. I right. uh, come ask Pastor this morning if I could stand up here and share something with you today. and uh, uh, Bear with me for a moment. But I just thank God, is Jesus the Lord of your life today? Amen. Amen. I like pastors share sometimes that video, do you know him? Because if you know him, he's the best thing that's ever happened to you. If you know him, no weapon formed against you can ever prosper. Amen. Amen. He's born for a purpose, in a season, for a reason, according to Father God. In Galatians 1, 15 and 16, Paul, he declared... That God, before the foundations of the earth, foreordained the moment and the hour that he would be born into the kingdom of heaven and that he would be grafted into the kingdom of his son and Christ would be revealed in him to preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. I'll read that to you. In fact, I must read something else to you. You want to come up here? So, saying all that, if you ever read the book of Esther... If you've ever read the book of Esther, you need, you need to read it again. So it says in verse 14 in chapter 4, For if you keep silent at this time, and now this is Mordecai talking to Esther, and Esther is one of the daughters of the nation of Israel that's been betrothed to Xerxes, not the king from the movie 300, but actually the king of, called Cyrus that ruled in that day, an evil man but that God used in order to redeem his people and free them. And Mordecai, speaking to Esther, said this, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and de deliverance shall arise for the Jews from somewhere else. You know, kind of like Jesus saying, If you be quiet, people, the rocks would cry out. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows but what you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this and for this very occasion. And that's what I want to share with you. Is God is saying... He birthed you and placed you at the hour and the moment you live in. You're not too young. You're not too old. You're not too illiterate. You're not too poor. You're not too rich. You were born into the kingdom of heaven for a time such as this. As a part of this ministry, what Amen. this man and this woman proclaims, of you being here not being happenstance or by chance today, or you just showing up because you thought it was a good thing to do, but God foreordained that you'd be here today, you'd hear the truth of the gospel, you'd see these young people perform, you'd hear what God has to say to the church of Jesus Christ. You were born for this season, church. If I never see you again, pursue the things that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of our God has spoke into your heart and life. Begin to speak out and do the things God has told you to do, for you were born for such a time as this in planet Earth. None of you are insignificant. None of you are unimportant. You are the most precious thing under heaven. For God so loved the world that he formed and fashioned a house of clay and breathed his own breath of life into it that he would redeem what is the most precious thing in all creation to him. Man created in his image. The kingdom of heaven in the earth. Amen. 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 Thank you, David. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. David Smith, Wesley Flippin, Bob Hooser, these are your elders here. They are men to be listened to and revered as they speak because I've, I believe the Lord had those men here as elders for a reason. So anytime one of those three stand up and share something, uh, please pay attention. Amen. I trust these men emphatically. Amen. Thank you, Father. 
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. The last two weeks, uh, we've shared on the Jesus-centered life. Exactly what uh, Teresa was sharing about there. Part one a couple of weeks ago was preeminence. Uh, preeminence meaning not that God is just first, but he's first in everything. In other words, he's first in your day when you wake up in the morning. He's first in your marriage. He's first in raising your children. You consider him first in all things, not just first by himself, even though that is true. Last week it was uh, vanity of vanities, talking about Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Solomon, who had everything that man could want. Solomon had everything that you could possibly fantasize about. He had it. Uh, And his conclusion was that it was all meaningless because he had pushed God out of the center of his life. And uh, for me and you, that's a type of pushing Jesus out of the center of our life. If we'll keep him in the center, we'll know what's going on in our lives. But if you wasn't here for those last two sermons... Uh, this will kind of flow right into it, so some of it you may not get, but uh, get those CDs and it'll all work together. The Holy Spirit's asking a question here to us as a congregation. Who is at your center? And there's actually only two answers. Either Jesus is at your center or you are at your center. I say, no, Eddie, there's, there's a lot of other things that could be at my center. I mean, possessions could be at my center. Other people could be at my center. Uh, The things that I own could be at my center. Habits, bondages could be at my center. Uh, Actually, the Bible talks about this. And again, it's in the last couple of weeks' sermons, but uh, it's all a root of an I complex. I am the center of my life. So if you're at the center, uh, your life's going to be full of pain. To To the level in life that you are frustrated, to the level in life that you are always having problems, to the level in life that uh, you, you never have enough, it's all because you have you there in the center. And uh, you will never be satisfied, not until he is in the center of your life. Can I get a good amen? Amen. amen. I know you're backed up from me a little bit today. I might have to pick up this podium and come down here a little bit. Um, I come from, uh, I, I'll tell you where I come from. Um, I come from being a business owner in my life, probably employing three or four hundred different people over my lifespan, uh, working in a huge corporation where egos and eye complexes are, you can't shake a stick at them, they're so plentiful. I come from the, uh, the place of, uh, I've been in the legal system both uh, because I was there for my own benefit, uh, trying to survive. And I've been there watching other people in the legal system. Uh, You want to talk about a system of uh, uh, lords and serfs, uh, the legal system. It is bad. Um, But it's all about me, myself, and I. I'm telling you, it is, as you watch there. Uh, If you you go to court sometime, April and I went to court this past week to uh, help something. And um, as I watched, it just... uh, all I could see was the uh, humanity that was hurting, that had been beaten up by life, that had been told that they were worms, and they believed it. And uh, quite a sad picture as you sit there and watch. I mean, there's actually this look on people's faces, and you can see that behind the eyes there's just something missing. And uh, as, you, as you look at these people, uh, if you can get beyond the irritated at the the lack of a a godly system, uh, you actually look into the humanity, and I can imagine how Father God looks at that. And and, uh, that is such a pitiful situation. I can't express to you how pitiful it is, uh, because it is. Who's at your center? Self-help, self-improvement, self-doubt, self-confidence, Self-promotion, self-reliance, self-esteem, self-righteous, selfishness, self-denial, self-abasement. I'll self-punish myself for things I've done wrong so that God will accept me. The Talmud, 
denominational doctrine that's separate from what the Scripture teaches. It's uh, self-imposed rules and regulations. Self-deception all leads to self-destruction. This is a happy message, is it not? I'm going to play the happy song now. See, natural thinking tells us that uh, some of these selves I just mentioned, well, they're good things, Eddie. Self-promotion, self-confidence. Actually, none of them are good if they're before him. If he's not at the center, uh, you're on your road to self-destruction. And, you know, the, the sad part about it is, is actually I can watch people, and I can see people on the road to self-destruction, and I can give to them some good godly counsel, not because it's mine, just strictly reading the Word, not even adding a, an opinion to it, and, and they'll still be on that road of self-destruction uh, because they've pushed him out of the center. We want to make sure he's in our center. Can I get a good amen? Amen. John 15, 7. I'm going to read it to you uh, how it uh, is literally translated in the Greek. I don't think I have a slide up there on it, but uh, I wanted you to hear me rather than look. Listen to what it says. It says, if you abide in me, and the words of me in you abide, whatever, if you wish, you shall ask, and it will come to pass to you. If you abide. It means if you are constantly present and have him in your center. If you are, if you are constantly present with him and have him in your center, then you can ask whatever you will, and he says he will do it to you. The, the, the thing is, folks, is so few people actually have him in the center of their lives. I don't believe that's true about this congregation. I believe that we are bringing him into our center. We are bringing him into all things in our lives. If you're doing that, say amen. 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 Hebrews 12, 11. This is in the English Standard Version, and the reason I did this is because it's more accurate. But listen to this. It says, For the moment... All discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields, and this is what Teresa shared this morning, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You will be full of peace of mind when you believe that you are innocent. When you believe that God has truly made you innocent, you will be full of peace of mind. Amen. That's, that's an awesome word right there. Um, the word discipline, I put it in red on purpose uh, so that you could see. Most people, when they think of discipline, uh, they run from that word. But actually in the Greek, uh, discipline means paradia, paradia, which means instructions that train someone to reach full development. Think about this now. This is, this is discipline from, who, from what God says it is, not what man says. Listen, instruction, training. Teaching that cultivates the soul. That's what paradigm is. Teaching that cultivates the soul. I got to thinking about that. You know, Jesus taught the parable of the sower. And uh, he sowed and some fell on uh, rocky ground. Some fell on the path. Some thorns come up among it. Some of it fell on good ground and it brought forth a harvest. But here's the thing. No farmer sows unless he has prepared the ground. Did you prepare your minds this morning before you got here? Or do you just come sit, it falls on you, it gets swept away, and there's no change in your life? You see, I got to thinking about it. The path was never prepared to accept the seed. The rock was never prepared to accept the seed. Even the ground that had the thorns in it, uh, those seeds were probably already there. It hadn't been cultivated, hadn't been sprayed, hadn't been worked, hadn't been hoed. Have you prepared your mind to receive from him today? Amen. You see, if you just show up, I always wondered that. Why is it that some people can show up in church year after year after year after year after year after decade and never change? They come to church, they're not prepared to receive the word of God. They don't believe there'll be a difference when they leave. They don't believe there'll be any change. They come in, they hear a message, 
hear maybe something that sounds like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I'll apply that. And they get out, they start their life over, and they never change because they never prepared the soul, you see. You never begin to think, well, am I expecting when I come to church this morning? How many of you come expecting this morning? Amen. Six of you. That's awesome. Well, uh, to that extent, that's the people that will get changed, you see. Everybody else will go home just like they are. Real happy message this morning. I don't know. Uh, we're having a cookout this afternoon. Y'all know that? Hot dogs, french fries. Yeah. Amen. That's right. The message will be horrible. The food will be good. It's better than the other way around. If the message was good and the food was horrible, you'd rather have the message bad. Amen. I want it all. I hear you, brother. Cultivate. Uh, Tim Kelly. Tim Kelly, I went to eat at Kim's house. Uh, Kim, uh, Kim, Kim Kelly. Tim Kelly's house the other night, and he used the word mutter. It, he had uh, put some strawberries in this water and some huh, basil. And he, he used a cooking term. You put the strawberries in just a little bit of water and the basil, and then you mutter it. You stir it up. You turn it around so as to, to draw the juice out of those berries. Uh, I didn't even know that was a cooking term, but it is. It's, it's a cooking term. It's the same thing that we're supposed to do to our minds. We're supposed to take this word in today, put him as the center of your life. If you don't get anything else, that's your word. And you're supposed to turn that around, turn that around, turn that. Well, how does that really work? When I get up in the morning, do I really think of him? When I uh, address my spouse, do I think of him first and then speak my words accordingly? Ephesians 4.29, do I edify my spouse or do I just keep my mouth shut because I can't edify for some reason? Which way is it? Edify. Amen. Mutter on that. You see, turn that over. Cultivate. Because if you don't cultivate your mind, it won't change. And you'll be the same year after year after year. The same problems you have today, you'll have 10 years from now. If that's the case, you know, you're wasting some of your valuable time. Don't do that. Can I get a good amen? <clears throat> what dictates what you think? Your experience, your opinions, your tradition, your religion, your family influence? Oh, the field's okay. I often wondered about that parable, that some fields will produce 30, some 60, some 100. Now, there are about, there's, there's a lot of meanings to that, actually. But here's, here's a lot of it. Have you prepared the soil? Do you actually take that seed in? Do you mutter it? Do you think about it? Do you water it? Do you fertilize it? Or like some people, I see their crops and, and the uh, the fields, they just, they're all over the place. You got corn this high in the same field, you have corn this high. Well, more than likely, it's all got the same water. What's the deal? Farmer have, hasn't put in the nutrients, you see. What are you doing? Uh, as this seed goes into you, will it produce 30, 60, or 100? You see, I want 100 fold in my life. I want it to produce big time. Amen. So I want to mutter. I want to think about that. I want to understand what God is wanting me to understand. I want him to be preeminent in my life so that I understand. Amen. Amen. The Jesus-centered life, part three. Menorah. Menorah. Amen. Does everybody know what a menorah is? Uh, actually, what I want Bart to put up there is the coat of arms of Israel. Coat of arms of Israel. The blue one, I'm sorry. It's a blue background. Sorry about that. It's on that. Yeah. This is on the coat of arms of Israel, the menorah. It's a Jewish symbol. Uh, no, but that's fine. It's, it's a, got a, it's a, it looks like a flag. But this is a menorah. And y'all have seen these, right? This is a type of the church. See, everything in the Old Testament, what, what does Hebrew say? It's a type and shadow. It's not as good as the real thing, but it's a type and shadow. It tells you what's coming. And the menorah... Is, was what was in the Holy of Holies that gave it li that give light. It lit up the Holy of Holies. It's kind of interesting, actually, uh, and I'll hit some of this, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but um, uh, the, more, the menorah has seven branches. And you start scrolling through them uh, so that they can see some of them. Some of them you see nowadays have nine branches. 
That's not the real menorah. The reason that the Jewish people do that is, is because just like if you read a website written by a Jewish person, it'll say G slash D. They won't put the whole word of God there because it's, uh, the name of God is so holy. Uh, that is their, that's their viewpoint from it. And actually, uh, the Father wants us to speak his name. Uh, you know, it's just like, you know, if I walked in the room and uh, Amelia, she wouldn't even speak my name because she thinks so highly of me. Uh, and, she, and yeah. See, actually, you know, and some people actually think that's love. Oh, he, you know, it's, you know, that's, but no, what's love is she runs up to me, calls me daddy, and throws her arms around me. That, that's love. That's what a dad wants, you see, not the other. But uh, these menorahs that you see all through, and I was reading Wikipedia, um, and it's just like I shared uh, Tuesday night at Bible study. If you read Genesis chapter 2, uh, God had told them not to eat of the fruit of the tree. Genesis chapter 3, Eve told Satan, uh, God told us not to eat of the tree or touch it. God didn't say don't touch it. So either Adam told Eve wrong or Eve made it up. That's what happens in the church. People extrapolate things that are not there. I mean, from Genesis, from God the Father, to Adam, to Eve, Eve got it wrong. Well, when you look at these menorahs, a lot of them, uh, they are constructed incorrectly because they don't look at Exodus where it tells you how to make a proper menorah. Uh, a menorah, again, it's a type of the church. It's about 63 inches tall. That's a big old candlestick. Um, and it's not a candle, by the way, it's a lamp. You know, uh, candles were not in Middle East until 400 B.C. Solomon, or actually Moses, was writing about this 2,000 years before then. It's a lamp. <clears throat> and right here it is. You see, those are actually lamps right there. Now, this is a type of the church. He's a light unto my path, a light a lamp unto my feet. Uh, it's a type of the church. And the beautiful thing here is that the menorah is only supposed to be lit with crushed, fresh olive oil. If you don't understand that Jesus was crushed for you, you see, this self-abasement, you feel like you need to punish yourself for things in life because you think you're helping God punish, but, but God says in Isaiah 53 that it pleased the Father to crush his arm which the arm there is Jesus. It pleased the Father to crush his arm. So every morning, the, the priest goes in to light the menorah. Uh, and, and Actually, I'm sorry, in the evening. This is interesting, too. I'm, I'm off base here a little bit, but that's all right. The menorah was lit from sundown to sunup. In other words, in darkness is when the light is lit. Uh, as you travel about in this world, this is supposed to be a picture of you, the menorah, that in darkness, you're the one shining forth the light. Amen. The, the center stem is supposed to be Jesus. You notice that uh, all the lights uh, on the left side point to the right, and all the ones on the right side point to the left, and the one in the center is the one pointing forward. You see? Everything's supposed to point to your center. Everything is supposed to be because of Jesus. And, and just another little tidbit, the Ark of the Covenant was actually suspended seven and a half feet tall inside the Holy of Holies, and the lamp sit here to the side. The, the lamp is supposed to be casting light onto Jesus. We point people to Jesus, you see, because we are flawed human beings. Uh, we may get it wrong, but if we'll continue to point to Jesus, you see, he's always correct. He's always right. And that sweet smell of that olive oil was always going up to the ark. You see, as you lift your hands, as you praise, as you talk to him, that, that sweet fragrance of praise is always going up to the ark who is Jesus. Jesus, the ark of the covenant is a type of Jesus. Amen. Y'all follow all that? Amen. Totally got off my notes there a little bit, but uh, you're the light of the world. This is what this is a type of. Um, Every piece of furniture in the tabernacle, every piece has meaning. It's a type of something. And as we study it, the reason we study Old Testament 
is so that we understand. Because what you do understand, Old Testament is Judaism, but it's a type of Christ, the new way. Amen. Y'all follow me on all that. Amen. Uh, let me show you John uh, chapter 1 here, and we'll come back to some of these menorahs. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I always like to point this out, because listen, there are all kind of false religions. There's all type of, uh, actually, folks who call themselves Christians that are not. Listen, anytime you lower Jesus to anything other than deity, it's a cult. Uh, Jesus is God. Uh, Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is God stamped on clay. He's the perfect radiance of who God is. You want to know who God is? Read the Gospels. That's God. That's Jesus walking about. That's God in the flesh. Amen. He's an awesome Father. He was with, the, he was with God in the beginning. He's the original. He's from the very beginning. He's at the origin. He starts it all. And then... Uh, next verse. Um, through him, this is the same thing as uh, what we started out with, keeping God in our center. Colossians 1, 15 through 18. Same thing. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Your spouse or your children, they were made of God. You honor them. Amen. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. You see? That picture of the menorah. Actually, Jesus being your sinner, he's the light. Uh, outside of that, men walk in darkness. But if they have him as their sinner, they walk in light. Amen. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness, this is, this is pretty awesome. There's a lot of meanings here, but uh, the darkness has not understood it. Um, folks, you don't have to be concerned about your enemy. He don't even understand how it is you are, how you are. Uh, he just throws stuff at you just to see if maybe you'll take something. But he doesn't understand how the light works. He doesn't understand how Jesus can come into your life and totally transform you, and all of a sudden you begin to rise above all those things in life that have held you down. Amen. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't know. He don't know how it works. Um, Numbers chapter 8, verse 1. <laughs> <clears throat> Again, we're going back to the menorah here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, I'm reading King James because it gets it right, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. Let me, share, let me say something right there. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not a theologian. I say that King James gets it right. I, I, that's just merely me saying I've looked at the Hebrew and from what I can see, it translates it as close as it can be translated in English. Uh, you need to look at it for yourself. Don't be Eve. Don't be Eve. Don't hear it wrong and then pass it on wrong. Don't be Eve. I'm just here, I'm here to spur you on to, to uh, study the Word for yourself. You know, don't take everything I say at face value. You study it for yourself. Amen. I don't care who they are on TV. Uh, if it's Joseph Prince, if it's Joel Osteen, if it's David Jeremiah, go to the source. Go to the scripture. Amen. And, and the scripture that's inspired is, is Hebrew and Greek. Amen. King James is a version of the inspired word. NIV is a version of the inspired word. Amen. <clears throat> you follow me there? Amen. Amen. Uh, you see... The reason that the uh, menorah is not just a candle lit and it's just uh, sitting there in and of itself is because he said, uh, make sure the lights uh, turn inward and then the one in front tur turns toward the front. Let me just go ahead and finish reading the scripture. Verse 3 says, And Aaron did so. He lighted the lamps thereof over against the candlestick as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 4, And this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold unto the shaft thereof unto the flowers thereof was beaten work according unto the pattern according unto the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses so he made the candlestick um, we have a pattern in the word that we're supposed to live by 
we can read it and understand it. This candle, and show the good candlestick again for me, Bart, if you would. Uh, this, uh, this menorah was made of one slab of solid gold, one slab, and formed into that menorah. It was a talent of gold. You know, you have the, you wonder where Jesus got all these different parables he taught. He taught the parable of the man who had, who was given one talent, and one was given two, one was given five. You know the story there. The man who was given one, he was given plenty, you see. But he went and hid it in the earth, the Bible says. But the Bible says it's a type of the menorah, the light of God. He, the Bible says, do you light a candle and then stick it under a bushel? Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine. Yeah. You know the song? Yeah. You see, you don't light a light on and then stick it under a bushel. Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine. You want to come help me sing in a million? No. Okay. Uh, you don't do that. You see, uh, that's disrespectful to the light. You, you don't do that. You don't, you're not given this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. Jesus, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, lives on the inside of you. You're not given that to hide it. Amen. You're given that to share, to let your light shine. In fact, you're only lit in the darkness. When it, the darker it gets, the lighter you shine. And it's so interesting. Uh, actually, the, the tools used to snuff out the flame and the tools used to trim the wick, the Bible says in Exodus they are also to be made of 100% pure gold. What's gold in the Bible stand for, folks? Well, I've done a bad job. Righteousness. You see, it's all because you're innocent. And the, the interesting thing is this. What a, what a priest would do, now this is your life. Stay with me, I'm about done. Uh, the wick, he would cut out the burnt places with that gold cutter. And then he would pull the wick up higher, you see. The reason that the wick is pulled up higher is it makes the light burn brighter. If, if Jesus is the center of your life and you begin to expose that center more and more, your life will burn brighter and brighter and brighter. The more wick is exposed, you've ever, you see them in the old lamps, the more you run that wick up, the, the lighter it gets. That's what we're supposed to be like. We're a type and a shadow of that. Can I get a good amen? amen? Amen. Let me show you a couple more scriptures uh, to help you. Well, Eddie, you keep saying it's a type of the church. It's a type of the church. Scripture interprets scripture. You see, I read, I read a rabbi's description of the menorah, and he had it all wrong. I mean, this guy can quote the first five books of the Bible from memory, and he don't know what a menorah is because he's not listening to the revelation of who of what Jesus is telling him in his heart. He doesn't see Jesus in Scripture. When you see Jesus in Scripture, you get those revelations. Uh, Revelation 2.1. I'm going to run through these here. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Revelation, a book of typology. Next Scripture. Remember the height from which you have fallen. And I, Repent, let me just give it to you quick. Repent here is the word matanoia. It, the translators, King James, they all pick this word. Repent is a French word taken from a Latin word, not the Greek word matanoia that's originally in Greek, which means to change your mind about God. Repent means to be sorrowful in Latin. doesn't mean that in Greek. It's a bad translation that everybody seems to follow. Amen. It's the word metanoia, to change your mind about who God is. Amen. If you do not repent, if you do not metanoia, change, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. All right, next scripture, please. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. Jesus telling you. The seven stars and the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Lampstands are a type and shadow of the seven churches. Seven, the number of completion. 
the complete body of Christ, not necessarily just seven churches, even though a lot of theologians can point out and show you that there are seven distinct type of churches. There's been seven different dispensations since Christ. We're in the seventh one. They can show you that. I don't know. Your pastor is learning. I, I'm, I'm reading some of that. A little bit of it's a little bit of a stretch for me. You know, if Scripture can interpret Scripture, put it on the shelf and wait until it can. And if it doesn't, just don't, you don't take it. You don't pass it on, Eve. Don't pass it on, Eve. Yeah, amen. Or Adam. Who, you know, Adam may have thought, to, to, to clarify that for you <coughs> ladies, uh, what might have happened there is Eve said, you know what, if I tell her not to eat it, she'll go hang around it. Eve, God said, don't eat, and don't even touch it. That might be what I, it doesn't say. Scripture doesn't tell us. I don't know who changed it. Somebody did. Adam or Eve changed it. Read it for yourself. Chapter 2, chapter 3. Take you three minutes. I mean, you can see it for yourself. All right. Uh, last scripture, I think. Very well-known scripture. I wrote it in King James here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Everybody takes this as a salvation scripture. Again, it could be, but that's not the context. Context is he's talking to the seven churches. This is the church at Laodicea. He's saying, not only are you not the center of the church, I'm outside the church. That's a sad commentary on a church, that Jesus is standing outside knocking, wanting him, wanting to come in. Amen. I pray that never be Freedom and Liberty Worship Center. If it is, I pray I be gone. I pray you be gone. Amen. You see, the, the, the menorah is a type of the church, and it's a type of us as individuals. You know, do we have Jesus as our center? Do we understand that we are burning the oil of the Holy Spirit that's made from fresh, crushed olives, and that we are fully forgiven, and that God was so pleased to have us as his children that he crushed his son. He does not crush you. He crushes his son. He crushed his son for you. Amen. You receive that. And uh, you let the uh, light of him, you let that wick continue to be exposed more and more. Don't, don't shut him in. Don't put him under a bushel. Oh, no. I'm going to let it shine. Are you going to let him shine today? Can I get a good amen? Amen. 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 One last scripture. Uh, Numbers 8 2. Speak unto Aaron and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. I just told you what that is. But lightest the lamps. It's the Hebrew word ale. And what it means is to ascend or to lift. Uh, when, when Jesus instructs and disciplines this is a little different from how some things are taught when he instructs and disciplines he doesn't beat people down look what he did with the prostitutes look what he did with the tax collectors the Pharisees the religious people said he's a friend of sinners he's our friend he cares he lifts us up I'm gonna tell you right now uh, this Aaron is not the great high priest he's a type of him Jesus is the only great high priest, according to Hebrews. But you lift up the wick. You lift it up. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, he encourages us. Uh, he will pick you up. Uh, if you're somewhere and you're getting instructed in the Word and it's a completely beating you down, I'm going to tell you, it's not the Word of God. I'm telling you that is not the Word of God. He is an encourager, not a discourager. Uh, he knows who you are. He knows we're made of flesh. He knows that we're made of dirt. He knows we're made of clay. I'm telling you, he is a lifter. He picks you up. Uh, I, I pray that you are picked up and edified by this ministry, not beaten down. I want you to know that Jesus loves you and cares for you. Do you believe that today? Amen. Stand with me.